you are yes. ready. We are going to record this, so if you don't want your face to show up on the video, you can feel free to turn your cameras off if you want. And Kevin, you look far too serious. Relax. <laughs> Be happy. And <laughs> Willie, take yes. it away. Off you Thank go. Thank you, Michael. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, it's always good to be back. I was here uh, at the Cell conference last year, and I'm so excited when uh, I got invited again uh, this year. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, today I want to share with you practical ideas about how we can all grow our teaching, our research, and also our service impact. I think the word impact is becoming uh, increasingly important in our in our work as a teacher, as a teacher educator, as a professor, uh, teaching or working uh, at the university. Uh, during appraisal time, for example, I mean, you know, your superiors, uh, your bosses will ask you the same question. What is your impact in terms of teaching, uh, in terms of research, and also in terms of service? And it becomes in, uh, even more important when you try to get your tenure, when you try to get promoted to associate professor or to full professor, they will always ask you this big question, what is your impact at the local level, at the university level, at the national level, and also at the uh, international uh, level. So today I'm going to share with you uh, a few things that I know about how we can help ourselves and also how we can help other people, our friends, our colleagues, our junior colleagues, uh, you know, to grow their impact. The key takeaway of my talk today is this, that impact, yes, impact is about us. Impact is about us being recognized, being able to, you know, uh, be appreciated, being able to, you know, get our promotion and stuff. But I think uh, in line with today's or the uh, conference theme today, I think impact is also about basically about doing things for other people, doing good things to others and making a difference to other people's life. Uh, my philosophy now, not when I was younger, my philosophy now is doing good is good for other people and also it's good for you. So doing good actually is doing good to other people should not be seen as a duty, but something that is joyful to do because it helps you actually, it increases your own health and your own happiness. Mark will say amen to that, happiness is the thing. Uh, three things that I want to share with you. Uh, number one is what is impact? I'm not going to go you know, provide a very academic definition of impact, but I'm going to give you some examples, real examples of what impact actually means to uh, people out there and also to people in uh, academia. And then I will move on and talk about the types of impact that are usually uh, expected and uh, encouraged at the university level, essentially uh, teaching service, uh, teaching research and service. And finally, the last part of my presentation, I'll be sharing my thoughts about, you know, how we can all uh, increase, enhance our impact in academia. Let me begin with some illustrations of what impact actually means. Very straightforward. I think you can tell that the kind of things that these two people are doing, they are featured in The Guardians actually. Uh, both are from Indonesia. Uh, both are people, normal people, perhaps people of limited means actually, but doing great things for the community. Now, these are people who, you know, Kiswanti, for example, she used to fast for 10 days in order to save money to buy books, not for herself, but for her community. Now, this is extremely important because if you look at Indonesia, it's one of the countries that is always, always at the bottom of the scale when it comes to the uh, literacy level of the uh, population. The same thing with the other guy there, Mr. Kinong there. He would go travel around with his mobile library. I think we need to get in touch with him, uh, Paul, and uh, maybe let him do the X reading as well for free for the community. <laughs> So I think we know it when we see one, and that is impact. Here is another example. Yeah, if you donate your time, if you donate your money uh, to help the needy, those who are not able to get enough food, 
basically, I think uh, what you do is impactful in that sense. You're making a difference to, you know, a group of people who actually need help in terms of getting more nutritious food at home. Closer to home. Uh, this guy, Michael Free, I think he has done a lot in terms of his contribution to professional development. He was in charge of the conference last year. I don't know how much time he spent doing this. That is a truly, truly meaningful uh, contribution, Michael. And I take my hat off to you. It's, 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 it's a big job and uh, it takes a big person, a big man like you uh, to do a big job like that. That is impact. Maybe another example is this. Yeah. If you were commissioned either by your university or by the Ministry of Education or by some funding agency to develop an English language proficiency test, which will eventually be used to screen, you know, uh, people who want to study in your university. Uh, I think that is also uh, impact because your work is useful your work is making a difference. Your work is you know, used by a larger group of people beyond your classroom. So that to me is impact. Again, impact is about making a difference to other people's life. Yeah, good for you and also good for other people. So in academia, for people like you and me, I think we are usually thinking in terms of making meaningful contribution in our teaching, in the kind of things that we do in our research and also in, uh, in the service area. And I'm going to talk about each one of this uh, one at a time. And throughout my presentation, I'm going to sort of organize my uh, discussion about the impact on each of the three areas, teaching, research, and service in terms of your impact at the local level, that's at your school level, at the university level, at the city level, and in terms of your contribution at the uh, national level. In Korea, that would be like the whole country. And also in terms of your contribution to the wider community uh, globally or internationally. Yeah. And uh, hopefully, please think about this together with me. If you feel that your impact currently is felt mostly at the local level, I think you can start thinking about how you can enhance your impact, you know, make your impact bigger at the national level and eventually also at the uh, international level. So that's what I'm going to do now. Uh, looking at each one of the three areas of impact in academia, teaching, research, and service at the local, at the national, and at the international level. And throughout my presentation, I would like also encourage you to think about your own impact currently. I'm not asking David, David is already up there. Uh, you know, the uh, more junior colleagues there, whether your impact currently is on the, low, on the low end of the scale, middle end of the scale, or at the high end of the scale. If you were to place David on the scale of one to 10, I'm sure all of you will say David is definitely 10. Or maybe, you know, the scale doesn't work for him, actually. It's, it's way above the scale. Uh, if you look at the two persons there on the right-hand side, uh, I think you know them. Michael, you know them, right? Michael? Yes. Uh, both of them were past presidents of Asia TAFL. So in terms of their contribution, I think we all know that they have done a lot for the community uh, locally and also regionally, and perhaps also internationally as well. What about you? Something for you to think about. Let's think together with me. And at the end, hopefully you'll be able to see more clearly, you know, how, or where you are in relation to where you want to be at the end of, you know, five years or 10 years, or at the end of your tenure, uh, teaching at the uh, university or other institutions. Let me now talk about teaching impact. Again, I'm going to organize this in terms of your teaching impact at the uh, local, national, and also at the international uh, level. At the local level, 
the most typical, you know, the kind of things that come to mind usually when you talk about your impact as a teacher <clears throat> is usually uh, in relation to your teaching performance, which is usually assessed by or evaluated by uh, your students. But teaching actually means much more than just doing, you know, the actual teaching that you do in the classroom. So here is just one example or some examples that I have here. And you can always add additional examples. So teaching is, can mean the quality of, it, of your teaching as evaluated by your students at the end of the semester, course evaluation. If you do a good job there, excellent, fine. <clears throat> But teaching also means uh, other things. Have you developed any innovative uh, pedagogy, for example? And these days people are thinking about blended kind of learning. Have you developed model that you can use for your own teaching and which you can share with your other colleagues in teaching in the same uh, university or in the same department? Have you uh, developed or done any innovative type of assessment? Uh, these days, people, you know, turn to uh, technology, for example, AI, artificial intelligence powered assessment procedures. Uh, I hope one day you don't have to assess your students' papers or essays. You just click on a button and the uh, machine will tell you, you know, how good your students are or whether uh, there are areas that the students need to uh, improve on. Curriculum development is another big area, which I will also park under teaching. If you have developed a course, one course that is used throughout you know, the university, I think you can demonstrate your impact there because what you do is not just useful for the particular group of students that you're teaching in the classroom, but it is useful for you know, the whole uh, cohorts studying at the university. For example, recently, uh, my university introduced a brand new course and some people were asked actually to develop a, this course It's called digital literacy course, which is, which is now becoming a compulsory course for everyone at the university. So we are thinking about 5,000, maybe 10,000 people who have to take the course every year. So your contribution here is actually very, very significant. At the national level, you just need to go beyond your university, beyond the school level and beyond the city level and uh, looking at the other provinces. Now, the good thing about working in Singapore is Singapore is a city state. You know, whatever you do is felt locally. And that means uh, at the university level and also at the national level, the, the nation is also a city. But in Korea, that is not the case. In America, for example, I think you need to uh, make sure that your work or your teaching is recognized in other states uh, as well. So here are some examples of uh, the kind of teaching impact that you can uh, think about maybe right now or in the future. Uh, giving uninvited lectures, giving a workshops in other cities, in other provinces, uh, being involved in the uh, national uh, curriculum reform, for example, mandated by the uh, Ministry of Education. If you serve as a consultant to schools in other places in the country, or if you serve as consultant to Ministry of Education on some you know, uh, educational project, for example, I think that to me is also impact at the national uh, level. In some countries, actually, they actually have this you know, award, Teacher of the Year Award. I don't know if that, you have anything like that in, uh, in Japan or in Korea. Mark, is there anything like that in Japan, in Korea? Not in Japan as far Not as in Japan, know. yes. In Korea, Michael? No, not in Korea as well. We, at Cotessa, we actually have or had a Teacher of the yeah. Year Award, um, but okay. it's kind of stalled right now, and that's mm. my, my fault. Okay. <laughs> so this is, yeah, <laughs> this is one way of showing impact, actually, uh, your teaching impact at the national level. Uh, two years ago, uh, I was giving a presentation at California TESOL, and the uh, keynote speaker was Mandy Manning, who was you know, awarded Teacher of the Year in 2020, in 2020. 
So there you go. I think I think if you have been awarded as the uh, you know teacher of the year at the national level, I think you can claim you know a higher level of recognition. There you go, teacher of the year award. Uh, I have not been awarded anything in my life actually so I've just awarded myself teacher of the week there you go not a bad thing at the international level ladies and gentlemen I think I think basically you have you just need to extend your reach beyond your country giving a lecture overseas which nowadays is easier to do because zoom I think you know the internet has made it easier uh, for people to you know, share knowledge and expertise with people from other countries. So giving a guest lecture in the UK, for example, in Australia, becomes easier today. Uh, becoming an external expert or consultant for a university overseas. A TED speaker, Mark, did you, were you involved in the, uh, uh, in the ER lecture on TED? No, MOOC, I think it's MOOC, yeah? M-O-O-C, uh, presenter. Or, or something that a lot of people are doing is, is this, becoming a moderator of a professional development group on maybe on Facebook or on some other platform. I would like to recognize my dear friend, Jocelyn uh, Wright, who studied a professional development group on Facebook. It's called Peace Linguistics. Uh, I think she's still accepting members, Jocelyn. It's a very nice group of people, uh, like-minded individuals who feel that, you know, we need to incorporate ideas from, uh, you know, this the kind of discourses that promote peace in, uh, in our teaching, in our students. Uh, here is another example of a big professional development group that Michael mentioned early on, Teacher Voices, which I moderated, which I moderate, uh, is a huge a uh, professional development group, uh, about 12,000 people from many different countries in the world. So in my appraisal every year, uh, I usually mention this to my you know, supervisors, to my head of department, to my dean, uh, is, as a way of saying that this is my contribution to the uh, international community. Uh, some examples of the kind of workshops that you can do overseas. Uh, seminars, lectures, and things like that that you can do. Okay, so that is teaching at the local, at the national, and at the international level. Let us now move on and talk a little bit about research. Again, I'm going to organize my talk uh, in terms of our research impact at the local level, at the national level, and also at the international level. At the local level, kind of classroom action research that you do, extremely important, but in terms of impact, I think it's, 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 you know, it's sort of limited to your own setting, to your own classroom, to your own students. If you write a paper, if you publish a paper and your paper is used by your colleagues for their teaching, I think that is research impact again at the local level. And if your research findings are used by the university to improve the quality of teaching of the uh, uh, faculty members, I think that also can be uh, used as evidence of your impact, again, at the local level. Local is good, but I think if you want to get promoted to a higher level, uh, if you want to increase your outreach beyond the school, I think you need to uh, try to get your hand to, uh, you know, to reach out to people beyond uh, your school and beyond your university. So at the national level, if you are able to work with the Ministry of Education, for example, with a university from other, uh, you know, provinces, and your research findings are used, disseminated by schools from throughout the country or universities throughout the country, or the Ministry of Education, or even by the industry like Samsung, for example. I think, I think you can say that, yes, you have made a difference at the uh, uh, bigger level, at the national level. At the international level, now this one is a little bit tricky. I think in my university in particular, because it 
has now become a full-fledged research university. If you want to get promoted to associate professor, for example, you need to show, demonstrate to the, uh, to the people, to the, you know, to the dean and to the uh, university people that your publications uh, appear in high impact journals. If you publish a book, you want to make sure that your books are published by you know, top publishers like Cambridge University Press or Routledge, Oxford University Press. Yeah. You may also want to show this. The, the next one is not very easy to, uh, to get hold of, but extremely important if you are able to showcase that your papers, your books are used actually by people from other places, from other universities. I'm sorry, I, I can... I can only think of my own book being used once upon a time globally. I mean, this book was, was sort of a bestseller once upon a time, and this book was used widely in many different universities in, in the world. Google citations or any other type of bibliometrics citations are becoming very important. There you go, Michael, good man, yes. Uh, do, do you need my signature, Michael? <laughs> I can send you my e-signature to you. Uh, Google citations. Now, this one is something that is that we need to deal with. Uh, in my university now, every year during appraisal time, you need to include the number of citations. This this did not happen when I first joined my university, but now it is becoming uh, you know uh, important as evidence that your publication, that your research is recognized by other people internationally. So yes, yeah, citations, uh, but in addition, of, in addition to citations, number of views, because nowadays you also may be able to get access to the number of people who actually look at or view your publications that appear in, for example, in academia.edu or in, uh, you know, online journals or in ResearchGate, number of downloads, uh, keynotes, presentations in international conferences and things like that. Here is an example of my favorite scholar from Korea. I don't know if you know her. Uh, she is from Sogang University. She recently got promoted to associate professor, very productive scholar. Uh, name is Yoon Sung Park. Yeah. So this kind of information becomes very important these days. I think the expectation is that for associate professor, you need to get maybe 500 or more uh, citations. And for full professors, you need maybe 2,000, 5,000, or maybe 10,000 citations. I mentioned earlier on about number of views. Now, at the moment, this is not widely accepted yet by people who uh, evaluate your uh, annual documents, but I think in the future it may be counted. I, what I have here is an example of a small paper that I wrote. It was published, but the Google citation is about 20 or 25. Very, very small. But when I put it in academia.edu, just look at the number of views there. It's like almost 30,000 views. To me, that is really, really meaningful although it may not count towards my appraisal, but I think this is very important to me as, as an academic uh, that, hey, a lot of people actually read my paper. And that to me is, is something, uh, is a source of uh, satisfaction. Yeah. Uh, this is an example of somebody whom you know very well, uh, Lindsay Heron, who recently gave a big presentation uh, hosted by the British Council Indonesia. I think that is an example of how a, an international presentation, keynote presentation uh, can be used as a basis for you to show evidence of your uh, impact at the uh, uh, regional or international uh, level. So I've, I've, I've discussed teaching and research and now uh, let's dive in and talk about service impact. Now, this one is understood differently by different people. Uh, at the local level, we are looking at people who serve 
uh, in the university, in the school, in the department, or in the faculty as academic leaders, for example, head of department, deans. I think this is service. A lot of people avoid, you know, uh, doing this kind of work, but this is service, an important piece of service as well. Uh, if you look after a big course with like 500 students and you look after like 10 different tutors, for example, as a course co coordinator, I think that is a big service as well. Again, people usually tend to avoid this kind of work. I do too. Uh, committee members, like academic integrity committee, conference committee, and any other types of committee work uh, that requires a lot of work. I think that's considered service at the uh, local, at the national. Uh, at the national level, again, you need to go beyond the university, you need to go beyond the city, and uh, you need to work with people from other universities, with the ministry uh, people, providing national work, workshops, national being involved in uh, committee work at the national level, and uh, becoming president of professional associations like Lindsay, for example, David. And uh, Michael, are you going to be president next year, Michael? Co-TSA? No. I'm going, to, I'm going to cast my vote for you. <laughs> national level, yeah? At the international level, there's a lot of things that we can do, actually. Uh, if you serve as editors and reviewers of internationally recognized uh, journals, I think that is a demonstration of your service at the international level. And sometimes you get invited to review uh, tenure documents. I think I've done it two or three times, uh, looking at the documents of uh, people uh, who want to get promoted to associate professor. I think that also is the kind of service that you want to be able to do. A PhD examiner, MA examiner, I think I've been doing this uh, quite a bit. Every year, maybe about two or three universities in Australia, in New Zealand, and the UK as well. If you are executive members of professional bodies, like for example, the Extensive Reading Foundation, I think we have, we've got a lot of people here, Paul Goldberg, Mark Helgerson, and uh, Rob Waring, and Tom Rob. Uh, these are people who have made a difference actually to, you know, to the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, to the larger community in terms of their uh, knowledge and the importance of extensive reading in language education. So ladies and gentlemen, the three areas of impact in academia, teaching, research, and service. And I have discussed each one of them in terms of their impact at the local level, at the national level, and also at the international level. The next few slides, I'm going to share with you some tips, the kind of things that I have done myself which I am planning to share with you. In terms of teaching, my understanding is that my philosophy is that every one of us can become a better teacher. Every one of us can become the best teacher that we can be, as long as we have a growth mindset. As long as we believe that we can do it, I think we'll be able to do it. We may not be the best, become the best teacher uh, you know, in the world, but I think we may be able to just get somewhere near there. So the growth mindset is, is important. Now, another thing for us to remember is this, you know, teaching is a learning process. You can't just become a very good teacher the moment you graduated and got a job as a teacher. Uh, it's a learning process and the journey can be very long. One thing you need to do is to have an open mind and to seek feedback from your senior colleagues and also in particular from those whom you know are the best teachers in your institution, in your school or in university. Learn from them, observe the way they teach. I think that is the best thing that we can learn from other people. Uh, if you want to increase your impact beyond your school, then you look at that little guy, you know, the image on the right hand side. I think this is something that we need to do. I know academics usually don't do this, but this is something that I've been doing the past few years. I knock on doors and I ask people actually, hey, I'll be in this neighborhood next year or next month. Would you want me to give a free workshop or free consultancy 
to your department or to your colleagues in your department. The key word for you to remember is free. Michael free. It's not Michael pay, but Michael free. Free workshops. I think people are very open to having you, you know, sharing your experiences, your knowledge and expertise uh, to other people uh, in the field. So that would be some of my tips for teaching. Remember that every one of you has the potential to become a very, very good teacher, an excellent teacher, the best teacher that you can be. For research, now this is one area that is uh, very important, especially for junior colleagues. If you haven't got a topic yet that you want to work on for five years, for 10 years, my advice, my suggestion is for you to choose to pick a hot topic. And in ELT, one of the hottest topics, if you ask me, is feedback. WCF stands for Written Corrective Feedback. It's one of the hottest topics. It's a lot of people who are doing it. So in terms of finding relevant literature, you won't have any problem finding references. And the good thing is that when you get published in this topic, uh, chances are higher that people will find your work, read your work, and maybe cite your work in the future. Another piece of advice is focus on one or two research topics. Do not, you know, do not spread yourself thin by doing, you know, a piece of research on a new topic every year. So focus on one or two research topics. Mark Helgerson, for example, has been doing happiness for a number of years, and he's been staying with that topic for many years. I've been doing extensive reading for many years now and I've become very good at it. I always cite Paul Nation. Paul Nation has spent like 50 years doing research on vocabulary, and he's like number one now in the world. Uh, you can publish empirical and also non-empirical papers. You do not always have to publish research papers or empirical research papers. You can also publish non-empirical, conceptual papers or opinion papers. Here's one example. My own publication, very small publication that appeared in the ELT journal some 10 years ago, is not database, is not empirical, it's just an opinion piece. It got published there. And right now it has generated, up to now, it has generated about 400 citations. That is a lot. Yeah. Now the key thing is that you can't just publish any thought paper or opinion piece. You need to do your homework. You need to identify uh, you know, an important gap in the literature and then write about it. So that would be my uh, example. And there are, there are many other examples like that. Uh, in terms of publication, I think, uh, you know, you can always uh, choose to publish in research journals or in practice oriented journals. I've done both, but more recently, I prefer uh, to publish in the uh, more practice uh, oriented journals like this one, Modern English Teacher. Usually the articles are short and uh, very readable. Uh, it's relatable as well. And the, the process usually doesn't take very long. And that's the kind of papers that I enjoy writing. Publish with your former supervisors. If you find publishing difficult, uh, try to work with the more experienced people, Mark Helgerson, for example, uh, Paul Goldberg, or publish with me. And uh, if you can, publish with big players, with Richard Day, for example, or with Stephen Krashen, something which I've done, actually. Stephen Krashen actually came to visit my university some two, three, four years ago uh, as a visiting uh, professor. So I had a chat with him. I took him to lunches and dinners and after three papers after three lunches uh, we decided to work together on three uh, papers all published now it's such a nice feeling to be able to publish with people you know top scholars in in uh, in our field uh, this is one thing that i want to share with you and this is probably the, the last one once you've got your papers published what do you do with it just leave it there and let people find your papers or your research. 
that was what happened to me some 30 years ago, 20 years ago. But today, with social media, I think you need to be brave enough to tell the world. There's a lot of competition there. Uh, once you get your paper published, then tell everyone basically under the sun through social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, academia.edu, ResearchGate. And more recently, I would send my papers to my colleagues uh, in Singapore, in Indonesia, and in other places as well. If you do it nicely, I think people will appreciate uh, you know, receiving your published papers. Oh, this is the last one. Uh, conferences. I think very soon we'll have on-site conferences. And uh, when you have an opportunity, do not just go for one paper, but try to present two or three papers at one go, if that is possible. Because, because it's a great opportunity for you to get more uh, with you know, just one single effort. I mean, if you happen to be in job, for example, you might as well present two or three papers rather than just one. And then the rest, you don't know what to do with your time. And uh, when you do attend conferences, make sure that you make it a point to meet people, to expand your network of friends, to meet big players in the field. I think that's very important. And also contact universities nearby and offer free staff seminar. So the keyword is free. Michael, free seminar. Uh, here are some other tips in terms of service. Join professional association. Uh, serve as journal editors and reviewers if you can. Free offer free webinars and uh, free consultancy and many other things. And that's how you can expand your network of friends. And that is how you can flourish by working with uh, closely with other people in the field. Uh, last year, I did a small presentation. It's about five or 10 minutes long. I'm not going to show it to you. Uh, but I think very important these days for you to network with like-minded individuals. The more, the merrier. But the thinking is that if you want to go fast, go alone. And if you want to go far, I think you need to go together. And I do have a lot of friends from many places in, at least in Asia. So ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of my presentation. Again, the key takeaway, I hope you remember, impact is about doing good things to other people and making a difference to other people's life. And remember doing good is good for other people and it's good for you too. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, in Korea, you always bring a gift to your host or to the people that you are meeting. And these are my gifts to you. My slides are available in my website. You just uh, scan the QR code. And these two eBooks are also free for you to download. And there are many other eBooks available in my website. The same website that Michael uh, mentioned earlier on, Willy Denandia. Com. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for listening. Well, that was very, very excellent, with the exception of that picture of me that <laughs> people, had to, people had to suffer through. <laughs> um, but that is, that is okay. I'm perfectly all right with that. There is his website once again. There's a, a couple of things that I've shot into the chat. We've got a good 10 minutes for questions and discussion. So I shall throw open the floor. You can either type your question into the chat box if you want to hear me read it, or you can just unmute yourself and talk to Willie. Mm. Yes, direct question is good. Let me just turn on your microphone if you have any questions or things to add because I give some examples. I'm sure there are a lot more examples that you can think about in terms of teaching, uh, in terms of research, and also in terms of service. Anyone, anyone? Yeah, I got my hand up, Michael, Daniel. Oh, you're on my other screen there. Go ahead, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, cheers. Hi, Willie. Hi, Daniel. Um, yeah, I was just thinking, um, you were mentioning about high impact journals and things like that. There's yeah. 
There's a hint that I always give people about choosing a journal, and that is if your literature review is genuine, look at the journals you got the information from and hit them to publish. And yeah, hit hit the high ones first and work your yep. way down. That was just a suggestion I wanted to add. Mm. Mm. Good idea. Yes, excellent mm. idea. Uh, let me just add a few more things though. Uh, a good example from my university, there are two group of people. Uh, one group of people are known as research uh, professors. And another group of people are known as teaching professors, essentially. And they publish different uh, types of papers in different journals. Now, those on the research track, I think they are expected to publish in a high profile, uh, in uh, you know, high impact journals. And, and usually, you know, the kind of things that you mentioned about the uh, literature uh, being very focused, you know, and the literature come from, also come from the same kind of journals. I think that's the expectation of these people to be publishing in those journals. But those on the teaching track, actually, they have a lot more flexibility. They can choose to publish in research-oriented journals and also in teaching-oriented journals. So, so the starting point is always look at you. Uh, who are you, where you are, and what you want to, uh, what you want to be. And the reason I'm saying this is that publishing in a high impact journal takes forever. It can take one year, two years, or sometimes three years. I mean, people usually don't have that much time. Keeping in mind that, you know, the uh, teaching load can be quite heavy for people working in teaching universities. Thank you, Daniel. If I can have a follow on question. Sure. What, uh, you were talking about at the local level. Um, mm -hmm. what, what's your opinion about your impact rating and publishing in local university based uh, journals? Mm. In house journals? Yeah, I think it's, it's a good it's a good place to start if 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 you are new. Uh, if you are a junior faculty, I think that's a, that's a very good place uh, to start. Uh, in fact, some universities, especially some teaching universities, would encourage you to publish, to do research that is important for uh, locally for your own university. So it, 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 it depends a little bit on, you know, who you are and where you are and what university you're working for. Uh, just looking at my university, for example, again, now it has become a, an intensive research university. If your publication is only good for your colleagues, for your university, I don't think it's considered good enough. I'm saying this because I'm 20 years ago, my university was a purely teaching university. The university didn't care where, whether you publish or, or not. But nowadays, they're very concerned about the kind of research that you do, the kind of publications that you that you have, and also the kind of impact citations in particular. I mean, it's it's, it's crazy. I, I I'm I'm not a big fan of citations, but but there you go. Mark, you're smiling. Thank you. No, I I agree with what you're saying. I also think yeah. um, I'm looking at a couple of things. Yeah. I'm my university is very much a teaching university. Yeah. So, frankly, I don't publish much locally mm. Mm. because I because I think I can make a bigger impact. Yes. Nationally or internationally, um, and that in turn makes a bigger impact on my local university. Ah, if you look at it that way, yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I would also encourage people to be careful about um, pay to play which sadly has become more and more, you know, uh, mm. kind of dodgy journals that, that, um, that you yes. got to pay to get published in. And yes, yes. I, I would just say across the board, refuse or resist that. I agree 100%. When there are more than 1000 journals in our field, ELT, that don't charge any fees, why, why do you want to publish you know, your paper in a journal that charges fees? I mean, it, it, it doesn't make uh, a lot of sense. So I would agree with you, Mark. Plus, usually journals that charge fees are dodgy. 
um, questionable in terms of their quality. You can't uh, really prove that they are predatory or anything, but you know, their main purpose, their main goal is to make money. Let me just give you an example. This is one example that I saw uh, recently. A journal or a publisher that looks after more than 300 journals. And uh, one journal has many issues per year, like maybe 10 or 12 issues a year. And recently I saw that one issue of that journal has almost 500 papers published, 500. And do you know how much they charge? 2,000 Swiss franc, which is about, how much is that? It's about 2,000 US dollars, actually. You just multiply, you know, do your math, multiply 2,000 times 500. I think I should retire and join that company, actually. <laughs> it's doing very well. But again, I don't know for sure whether this is a legitimate journal or it's 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 a questionable journal. It's it's hard to say because they have becoming they have become very smart now. They hire, uh, they do this thing called uh, crowdsourcing. You know, they can't possibly have expertise in house. They will have to uh, crowdsource it and ask good academics to serve as editors and to serve as reviewers. Do they get paid? I don't think so. They don't actually. So it's a bit scary. I believe, Willie, that Kevin Kester has something that he would like to ask you or a comment to ask. Yes. Go ahead, Kevin. Yes, yeah. Kevin. Both. Go ahead. So both just, just in terms of the conversation that we were just having, I, I want to mm. point out that in Korea, it's common to pay for publication. So it's mm. a slightly different culture from pay to play, but it's just locally is the way that things are practiced here. Uh, yeah. And as a viewer, I, appre I also appreciate it because you get paid to review. So it, it, mm. it's on both sides. Um, yeah. But just to point out, there's a cultural sort of specificity. Here. Yeah. yeah. But Will, I, I, I want to ask a question about this because you were speaking about uh, publication tips uh, and primarily publishing with big hitters uh, and publishing with your former supervisor. But do you yes. have any experience publishing with students in your lab? And what's your experience with publishing with students and some tips that you would mm -hmm. have in terms of navigating publishing with students, but keeping the quality of your research very high? Mm. Yes, uh, actually the past few years, I've been publishing with my graduate students. Uh, you know, uh, I would look at the uh, papers that I feel are publishable. And then I would uh, give them advice in terms of how they can shape, expand, and refine some part of it. And then we co-publish together. I mean, the students is always the first author. I think, I think, I think we need to remember that that's your students' work. Uh, your job as a supervisor uh, is to provide support and uh, to provide pointers and directions. But you can serve as a second uh, author. I have not done any empirical research with students not recently but usually it's based on uh their papers their term papers if the term papers is really good then i would ask them to tweak the papers a little bit and get it published usually in a teaching journal not a very high impact uh, research journals which usually requires a lot more work now i remember that's not true because some of my ma students actually did their thesis based on some empirical data and I have been able to help them also publish in fairly good uh, journals. Yeah. All right, Willie, I think we have time for maybe one more question. I see Nicole has written in the chat box. Do you have any advice for approaching big names such as yourself? <laughs> Buy them lunch <laughs> or dinner. <laughs> well, the first thing is get to know them. Uh, I, think, I think big people are people like us, actually. Uh, write to them and, you know, write nice email to them. Uh, get in touch with them several times and don't ask immediately to, hey, would you like to write together with me? I think I think it takes quite a bit of time for you to get to know them. Uh, Krashen, I've known him for some time. So when I met him in Singapore, uh, you know, the whole thing was very easy. You know, we, we, we just clicked. I mean, and, and we had a long conversation about his career, about his research, and about many other things. So yeah, get to know them first.
before you ask for anything. I mean, that's that's pretty uh, standard, isn't it? And Tammy says ego stroking will get you a long oh, way. Oh, absolutely, true. yes, that's, yes, that's absolutely. true. Um, that's true. I would, I would just like to add that most of the people that you that you might consider as big names are actually they're real humans and they're actually very very <laughs> nice people. Oh yes, uh, they're not. It's not like you're trying to get you know into BTS's tour bus or anything. <laughs> um, you know, just go up and talk to them because they're they're yeah. really uniformly very very nice and willie is a, mm. a great example of that um we are out of time but thank you so much willie as usual an excellent excellent job with the exception of that picture of me <laughs> if you'd like to continue the conversation you. you can go on to discord yeah. and do that otherwise feel free to head on to your next session I will be handing over the hosting duties to somebody else in one second. Hope you've enjoyed the conference. We've got one more hour to go and then you can go eat, refresh yourself, <laughs> relax, watch the new episodes of Ozark on Netflix. Oh, and then yeah, we, will, watching Ozark. we will we will see you all tomorrow. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Recording Michael. is going to stop. <laughs>